Hello everyone, welcome to this Inter-Intellect special where we're not really sure what we'll be doing, but it's going to be a lot of fun. We've never done this before. Um, my name is Anna, I founded the Inter-Intellect, uh, which is a global community and talent platform for public intellectuals. Uh, and I'm sitting here with two uh, prominent Inter-Intellects, Nebras and Visa, who I sure you know from Twitter and their blogs and, and websites and general awesomeness. Um, we will be discussing in a very loose uh, way, um, be fit for um, sitting in our pyjamas at home uh, during the lockdown, uh, about humaning, uh, which is a concept that Nebrasi brought up at one of our inter-intellect salons, um, and it immediately captivated everybody's imagination. And we have Visa here, because I think, Visa, you are the internet's resident expert on humaning. <laughs> so I would really right. love to explore uh, what this concept is, why it may be the most important thing to think about um, in, you know, June 2020 uh, amidst uh, all these global and local problems um, when many of us um, have lost so much of our freedom of movement um, or freedom of, um, you know, um, economic mobility at the moment uh, when we're all in one way or another rethinking who we are, um, what's our place in society. Um, and how can we be more, most, most useful and most um, fulfilled in, in this life. So Nibras, if you would like to, you know, just maybe give a little bit of intro of yourself uh, and also introduce us to your concept of humaning. Awesome, thank you, Anna. So I'm Nibras and I am a creative in London, soon moving into UX design, which is a lot of fun so far, that transition. Um, I'm currently in South London, so you're going to see me muting myself a lot because it's really, really loud out there. And humaning, so humaning is a phrase that I've thrown around a fair bit because um, I think at one point it hit me that for about the last 10 years or so, so I'm 25 now from when I was about 15 or 14, that the key thing that I was learning or attempting to improve is something that I think of as a core human skill or a collection of core human skills. Um, and it's almost as if there's one mega skill that when you learn it, you become better at multiple different skills. So it's the same thing that makes you better at dancing as at singing, as at writing. Um, and I guess a kind of meta skill. And that's the thing that I've most been fascinated with. And I guess sometimes that takes the form of personal development, but I think it also looks like many other softer things that maybe we don't talk about too much. Uh, thank you so much for this introduction. I'm quite, I remember Sheila Hatton's book, uh, which I think is kind of like an older millennial manual on uh, how to be a person. Uh, and I, I, I feel that there might be some parallels here. Uh, so I would love for you to address that. And of course, Visa, you know, at any point, if you feel like jumping in. Um, and I'm wondering, what is the difference in your view uh, between um, humaning and, and decency? I find that, you know, we have this lost art of being a decent human, a good citizen, um, which I think is increasingly important. Like our generation is rediscovering this civility you know, what it means, what, what are the civic qualities of, of a person. So if you guys could tell me a little bit about that, um, I think our viewers would be very interested. Mm. Lisa, jump in whenever you feel like it. Um, so something that I, I've been thinking about a lot recently is um, if I'm sitting having a conversation with someone and I feel internally relatively calm, um, and I'm, you know, I don't have to be entirely at peace, but things are slightly quieter. I'm much, much more attuned to what's going on with that person. And I can pick up a lot of, there's a lot of reading that's going on, right? So you kind of can sense what they're feeling. I can direct my attention towards them. And I can sometimes very actively, it feels like nurturing them. So there's a, a having a conversation with a friend and you can kind of pick up, okay, maybe they need to be lifted up a little bit here. Um, or maybe they need this right now. Or, oh, you coughed, you need something as simple as a glass of water. But I think when I'm internally very busy, so if I'm stressed or if I'm burnt out, 
or even when I was a few years younger and there were so many thoughts and emotions go on, going on inside that I had no tools for dealing with. There is no space to read the other person or feel what they're feeling because the drama that's going on inside is so intense. Um, so to bring this back to what you were saying about decency, I, I think it becomes much easier to be decent when you have space to recognize what's going on with others and when your attention can actually move outwards and engage with other people. That reminds me of, uh, you know, I think, so there's this, there's this almost a trope or, or just this, uh, this, I don't know if it's like a, like a Zen koan or if it's like a parody of a Zen koan, but this idea of um, empty a cup or, you know, like I think uh, in Star Wars, even there might be a phrase that's like, you have to unlearn what you have learned. And right, the, the idea of the empty, empty your cup thing is like some guy starts pouring tea and then it starts overflowing. And then he's like, oh, how, why are you overflowing my cup? And it's like, you know, like just as you are not emptying your cup so that you can have the tea, like you need to empty your cup so I can teach you something or so you can, you can listen to me. Right. And I, I used to hear that and read that and be like, okay, like, you know, this that sounds kind of mundane and kind of like obvious or bland or like, like what do I do? What does emptying my cup mean? Like, you know, it, it sounds correct kind of, but like, what does it actually mean? And I have come to understand it better. Uh, I would say from being on Twitter actually, and from witnessing that, from witnessing multiple conversations play out with multiple people and noticing how, and you know, Twitter is a, it's a, it's not a high, um, bandwidth medium it's only text and it's like short amount of text so right? see so this you can't there's not a ton of um kind of uh meta cues or extra additional cues about what's going on but even so even in that limited um domain or the limited medium i found that sometimes some people when they ask questions or they're just being just playing or saying stuff other people sometimes they come to it with like this very open-hearted curiosity or, you know, they, they reply very elegantly and beautifully to what the other person is saying. Like they, they, they interpret, they receive that person's tweet even, right? And they respond in a way that's very full. Whereas other people, maybe even most people, they, they bring all their baggage with them. They're like, oh, you know, you're saying this, like, is it because of that? Like you have all these assumptions about what the other person is saying or what they mean. And the more of those assumptions you bring with you, uh, which is, you know, the less empty your cup is, the harder it is to even see the other person or hear the other person. Like you see a phrase and your brain is, because your cup is not empty, right? It's because you have this pre-existing um, framework in which you are force-fitting everything else. And so, yeah, it, 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 you don't even think about how can I serve this person or how can I play with this person in a, in a helpful and full-hearted person to person way is more and when I saw that and I realized that wow um, different people have such different experiences and they they carry them, themselves with such different energy energies I was like okay I want to be more uh, present I want to be more fo- want to be more able to to receive people I want people to feel like if they see me interacting with them they can count on me to to be there for them and then that deepens the relationship and we have been humaning that way that's my experience. I love this. Uh, I love that you brought up that you actually learned openness from, from being on Twitter because this right. has been my experience as well. I know that Twitter gets such a bad rap, but for me, I, I don't think I would be able to, you know, facilitate three, four inter-interact salons a week where 40 people come in from all these different disciplines, ethnicities, countries, religions, opinions, uh, you know, um, if I hadn't spent the past 10 years, in, you know, immersed in this cacophony of opinions. And of course, there's a lot of aggression and you try to like, kind of like stay away from that. But I think in our niche, in our um, a community, it's a very healthy diversity of thought. And I know, you know, if, if you guys, um, you know, uh, I, I know, I know that the people that um, come to my salons know that I, I talk about this a lot and, and maybe Visa, when you start your own internet salon series um, next week, you will also be, be touching up on this. I always say that if people, it is a moment when you understand that you are a city of different people, 
the moment when you understand that you're like this stack of different desires and past experiences and and ambitions and they are sometimes like tearing you apart they are sometimes extremely mutually exclusive uh, one to the other and you start respecting that in yourself and almost maybe having a sense of humor at least patience with it like oh now it's superstitious Anna but by the time I'll make it down the to the, the first floor uh, I will be back to my mm, you know uh, let's think about GDP Anna and that's fine and it can even be in the same sentence in your in your head right um, and, and that's fine and I think when you understand your inner conflict or contradictions that way is when you become allowing of contradiction in life so if you see yourself as a room full of people who don't agree with each other because that's what we are you will be much more chill in a room but that has actual people who don't agree with each other you will absolutely. be like that's how people are <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely it's like you know like the the psychology and therapy process of doing parts work right and when you first come across that i don't know if, if it was the same for both of you but after i came across that like now my day-to-day -day language i'll usually say oh this part of myself wants to do this and this part of myself wants to do that um and to me it's so normal but i think sometimes i'll speak to certain friends and they're like what's going on across <laughs> like well, what's happening what are you talking about but I think something happens when you, like you said, you realize you're a city of people and you recognize there are all these residents and then you assume the role of facilitator. And, and when you're a facilitator, people can, you know, they can shout and argue with each other, but you'll, you'll keep it somewhat peaceful. And I think I completely agree with you. If you're not, if one part of you, if all parts of you are welcome, and you're not disowning something or pushing something away, you're a lot less likely to be reacting very strongly when other people demonstrate those parts, right? Because I'll see them in myself very often if I'm having a really, really strong reaction. It's like, oh, okay. That's something about myself that I'm trying to hide from myself. It's a bit like just to add a footnote to that. I, I, I notice that in myself and in others a lot that you are most combative against ideas that you very recently held, but got disillusioned of. So obviously the most extreme example um, is, is religiosity um, versus atheism. So if you're a recent atheist, if you had just lost your faith, you will likely be the least patient with people who still hold on to theirs. Whereas in a couple of decades, you kind of like that eases up. And I think it's because you still carry the religious person inside. That person is still very, very prominent and you have to fight it. And there's this internal conflict. And when you actually like meet somebody who's like the old you, that is still very much kind of like whispering in your ears. Um, that's, that's a triggering um, experience, right? Right. And another version of that, that is, I think, similar, related, but maybe a bit different, but still that same kind of um, preemptive reaction kind of, thing uh, I witnessed it with myself recently when so you know I and it's extra funny for me because my my whole thing on Twitter and like like my brand or my whatever is that I try to be as as friendly and nice and encouraging as possible but I've noticed that recently um, I mean it's all I think it's always been there but I've noticed it more recently because it's happening more when someone um, responds to me in a way that feels very incongruent like it's very it's just and so I, so I have this whole, you know, this, this whole playbook of what being a skillful reply person is, right? And like, you'd be supportive, you'd be engaging and whatever. And when, and, but what I noticed was when I get particularly kind of clueless replies, uh, I have this emotional reaction inside me that's very it's angry, actually. I get angry at the other, and, and I sit with that, I'm like, wow, why am I mad at this like random person? And I can see that the reply is, you know, it's, it's not even negative or bad faith. It's just kind of like, it's a bit non sequitur maybe. Like, it's not related to what I'm saying. Like, I said A, therefore B, and you said, what about something else? And then I, I, I sat with that feeling. I'm like, why, why do I feel that? That doesn't make sense. Like, I'm usually so whatever. And I realized that, and then I, like the, 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 the path that, that line of inquiry let me down, I ended up crying in the middle of the day. I realized that, um, so when, when I was younger, 
uh, I was, you know, the same kid that I am now in, in that I was very curious, very divergent, very random, very explorative. And I was punished for that in a, in a bunch of ways, like socially, by teachers, parents, whatever, like casually. And so what I learned was, I guess, that you can't be stupid. I mean, when I say stupid, I, it's a, uh, that's just like my shorthand for something much more specific, which is kind of like, you can't present yourself in a way that um, isn't constructive. Or I don't know if I'm, I'm framing it correctly, but like the, the conclusion that I, I came to in my head was like, oh, uh, I wasn't allowed to be stupid. And by stupid, I mean like ask dumb questions or not be relevant or not be whatever. Like I was punished for, for being stupid in a certain way. And like while I advocate for allowing people to ask dumb questions, like there's no such thing as a dumb question. You should be willing to explore every dumb question in every direction. But like when I, I, I realized that um, other people were making me feel angry or like I felt tension and conflict inside myself when I saw it happening. And then I realized that, oh, it's because I've internalized some amount of the punishment that I used to receive and it's almost like I want to protect them and it's this and I, I did another thing that clarified this for me was um, ContraPoints Natalie Wynn she was talking about how um, in the trans community for example and you know the trans community is actually a big community with many different points of view and everything she was saying you know there are there are like the, there are some people who consider themselves kind of like moderate and, and um, very respectable and proper folks who try to you know be be taken seriously and be very mature and whatever. And then there are some who are kind of like, relative to them, they feel like those are the, the screeching, noisy, kind of um, troublemaker, like um, out, outrage seeking or trying to push boundaries in an unproductive way. That's what it looks like to them. And these people get angry at those people with the phrase, with, and they say things like, people like you are why they don't take us seriously. People like you are why, you know, um, they hate us. Like they hate, they, so they hate me because of you in a sense, right? And so what, it can become this internal conflict between two, two groups of people who actually have more in common with each other than with the outside world. But because the, the, the first group of people have received um, negative feedback or, or received abuse even, right? Like the unwarranted, unfair, cruel abuse from outsiders, they then kind of internalize that and then they're like, you know, it's because of these behaviors or it's because of these things. And, and, you know, I have learned that if I don't do that, I don't get punished. And so I have to stop you from doing that so that you don't get punished and I don't get punished kind of by association. And then the, the tears come when you realize that, oh, I'm, I'm, I, am the, I have become an agent of the problem, right? I've become an agent of the, the enforcer of the, the violence or the selfishness or whatever it is. And yeah, it's just, uh, it's very trippy to, when you catch yourself even even when you have a brand that's like kindness and, and vulnerability and whatever, and you catch yourself getting angry at someone else, I'm like, oh wow, like this this shit goes deep, <laughs> and you have to be kind to yourself when you realize that's the case, and then you have to let it pass through. Oof. It's also a little bit like thank you so much for sharing that, and obviously this is something we you know know intimately from our own lives, but also it's something that you know in politics you have this rule of thumb that um, the the radicals are always more mad at. Um, the moderates than the outside world, right? And then the others. Um, so the internal conflict is almost for this very reason. Uh, what you don't want is to see the example of the outside world that you dislike on the inside, right? Um, and that's very interesting. And, and also I feel like you're doing this important almost missionary work on Twitter to make it a better place. And you do that in the interintellect and in all the other communities that you're engaging with. Um, and it's a bit like, I'm doing all this work to be articulate and have a very high level conversation and then slaloms in this guy and he just like disrespects my hard work and maybe it's the same in the trans community for the people who feel like we're doing such important work to to create a more presentable cause to those who don't understand us and then there are still the people who, who make us less legible to the outside yeah it's a uh, it's it's and it can you know it's there's there's so many ways you can you can then choose to see that like whether it's uh it's it's almost it's up to you i guess but like it it's just very sobering i think to realize that in fact you so i think an assumption you might make at the beginning is that 
as I develop as a person on whatever metric, whether I'm becoming more successful in my career or I'm becoming more whatever it is, you, you, I think the, the natural assumption is that these things would become less of an issue, but it can actually become more of an issue. Like the more, and you know, there's things like, you know, this, and you know, I, I feel like now I, I kind of understand better why, you know, so uh, Taylor, for example, on Twitter is kind of famous for, for calling people imbeciles, right? And I kind of get it more and more the more time I spend on Twitter. I try, I, I, I'm, I tr- I'm trying to commit myself in the long run to, to never calling people names. But like, just if the, the more work you do and the bigger, the, you know, the more time and energy you've invested in trying to develop an understanding and, and the volume of people who misunderstand you increases, it just becomes... Like because you have a memory, right? Like you, you have a memory of all the bad things that have happened to you, all the misunderstandings, all the frustrations, and that doesn't go away. Like you have to actively work to zen it out, kind of. And I'm guessing that at the scale that you know, like those like very prominent public intellectuals uh, encounter, like the volume of misunderstanding is so high that even if, and it's it's actually gets to the point where. Even if they take the trouble to interact positively with uh, the first person that's frustrating them, there's another one behind him and another one behind that, and it's just infinite. So you might, it probably feels like oh, you might as well just yell at them. And I found myself thinking that in my case, sometimes my 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 frustration or anger almost comes from me projecting my expectations onto the other person. Like I expect them to take the conversation as seriously as I take every conversation, right? I take conversations very seriously. And so I'm forced to almost, um, and, and this ties back to emptying the cup again. It's like, uh, I have to, like, so the, the frustration almost, it's because I began with the assumption that you are at my level. Like that's the, the, the gift that I give you in a sense, that we are equals and we are, you know, both trying to have an honest, respectful conversation. And if the other person is not, like, and, and you can't know for sure in advance, right? In the first couple of exchanges, especially over Twitter with strangers or whatever, you don't know whether the person is trying to have a serious conversation and failing or they're just screwing around and they don't actually care to engage, right? You're not, you're not actually sure. And like, you want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but if you always do that and the rate of misunderstanding is very high, you are going to get like psychologically, emotionally burned. So you have to kind of be, to, to, to survive, you have to be a bit, you have to kind of um, lower your initial um, assessment or evaluation of how serious the other person is. Which, when I when I realized that that was a path I could take, I was averse to it for a while because it almost felt like it almost felt a bit disrespectful. Like I I I respect you by holding you in high regard that we are having the conversation at this level, but there's a chance that you're not. And if I'm gonna assume that you started from like a low, like then there's this there's this disparity that begins and I don't like that disparity I want to believe that we're all equals but again it's not so even that is my frame right and it's a every frame has limitations it's it's not better or worse it's just different and like I have to accept that you know people are different which is a it's, a, it's an endless trip I think you can go on for hours it's like just it's so humbling in a way that uh, an interaction with another person you have, you have to empty your cup repeatedly every single time Absolutely. To be honest with you, Visa, even I've been getting frustrated at some of the replies that you get on Twitter. So I'm, <laughs> I'm projecting and I think it's exactly as you said, there is, there's like an expectation that I have, of, for example, the way that I'm going to behave. And when, I mean, Twitter is just a massive game that we're all choosing to play. And I always joke that Twitter is the only game that I play. Um, and when I think sometimes what I find really interesting is like being good at Twitter is the exact same as being good socially offline. But sometimes people don't make that connection. And it's if you approach Twitter in the same way that you'd approach walking into a room full of people, you'll be great and you're going to do fine and you're going to have a good time. Um, And I think sometimes the frustration comes because, like you said, I have this expectation that the rules are obvious. The rules are like you're playing the social game. And then I think it becomes, at least on my side, my reaction's a bit like, <laughs> why are you being like that? <laughs> you know, like, you could, you, could be, you could be nice and that doesn't mean don't disagree, but there is a way to reply, like you've said many times, that doesn't take away from the other person. Um, and one other interesting thing that I was thinking when you were talking about this idea of policing yourself is, 
I, I mean, I almost relate to that from kind of oldest child syndrome, right? But when you're the firstborn, you, you police yourself very much based on what your parents expect. And then like for me, you know, 10 years down the line, there's some little, some little creature who's breaking all the rules. <laughs> and all of a sudden it's, it's, it's a lot of frustration. It's a lot of like, wait, you, you get to stay out till what time? Wait, you, you get to do what? I, I didn't get to do any of these things. And I think that's quite similar probably to a bit of what's going on here, at least for me. See, Anna, Anna has a smile of recognition. Yeah, I'm also an eldest child, and the, the parentification was very, very heavily ongoing. Yes, uh, throughout my throughout my childhood, and I definitely I became a very late blooming rebel, and I'm still in the re rebellion phase, and I hope it will never stop. Uh, because uh, yeah, I only started like even going out when I was like 23, so it's definitely just like li living inside um, a library. But I'm so I'm so uh, happy that you brought up. Um, you know, the, 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 this false dichotomy of online and offline. Like Twitter is real life for a lot of us and the inter-interact is real life for many people where you, you know, you fi find your spouse and you write your book drafts and you uh, discover your calling in life and you meet your real friends. And, and, and you know, I, I always try to explain to people like the Twitter me is the real me. Like that's as much like under my control and authentic as anything that can get like um, obviously like that persona if you want is the persona that I have when I'm you know offline home alone just thinking to myself um and definitely the I think the internet act is really built on this whole idea of the new IRL and how to create spaces that are that have heavily digital components but are interwoven in, into all parts of life, right? All parts of us. Uh, but I'm wondering, Nibras, and, and this is, I think, really strongly comes from what Lisa, you said, and, and I'm, I'm, it's something that, about which I'm on the fence. <laughs> I love asking questions where I don't know. So like really, you know, enlighten me. Um, do you think that humaning is by definition something that we have to undertake, undergo, um, create, build from scratch? Uh, in, in hostile territory? Is it always despite something? Is it our reaction of authenticity, of freedom, of being ourselves, as opposed to the opposite of that? Or is it something where we have a chance to, you know, engage in uh, communally? What do you guys think? It's an interesting question. Nibur? It is. Do you want to go first? Uh, okay, um, so one of my uh, joke tweets that is that I mean quite seriously is that civilization is a kind of recursive game of potty training, which is that, and which is that you know so like potty training is the first I'm one. Not of the surprised first thing how highly quotable you are, but this is definitely right. a tattoo level. Love it. Yeah. So, I mean, at its, you know, and it's one of the first things we learn as human beings is to go to the toilet on time, as on schedule or, you know, as appropriate, as convenient. And, you know, it's like, you just, I'm thinking about like every, you know, when the parents are with kids and they're like, okay, we got to go, to, we're leaving this place, we're going to go somewhere else, like make sure everyone goes to the bathroom. Like, yeah, like this, this, that basic thing. And then it's you kind just... Of crazy, like, that's crazy, right? And it's really crazy. Right. And like... Yeah, yeah, I never thought about that. That's, that makes no sense that we actually manage to, like, you know, time our bowels. Like, yeah. show, show me another species that does that. Yeah, so the, the natural organism and, like, all organisms is they just go and they gotta go, right? Wherever. But, but, like, as humans, like, and again, as infants or as, like, toddlers, like, one of the first things we're trained is, you know, like, don't, like, it's a shameful to, you know, pee your pants and, and like you have to go through that. Like, and that's like, none of us remember the specifics, but like it's deep, deep in the psyche. And then it goes all the way from there. You go to school on time, you do things at on schedule. You right? eat and on schedule, time, right? You don't yeah. eat when you're hungry, you eat when the factory yeah. does it's a break. Ex exactly, right? So uh, there's this idea called the tough tomato principle, which is that tomatoes in general, they are all tougher than what is ideal for delicious tomatoes. Like if you grow your own tomatoes, you'll just have nice, soft, succulent tomatoes. 
But any tomato that you buy from a supermarket has been through an industrial process and it has to, the tomato has to survive the truck, it has to survive the container ship, it has to survive you know, the, the things. And so tomatoes are bred to be tougher than what is delicious because they are optimized for the industrial process. And we are all tough tomatoes, right? Because we have been bred through that process of potty training and, uh, you know, we've been... And, the, and like, you know, civilization is, has all these wonderful uh, benefits. We are having this conversation because there's internet, because there's microphones, technology, and it's all produced by factories and people in those processes. But, like, it's potty training all the way down, right? It's, you go to school, you show up on schedule, you, you make plans, you, everything according to schedules and things. So we, we lose a sense of our feelings and we lose a sense of, you know, like we have, we're supposed to have our feelings at appropriate times, right? Like you, you, can't, you can't have an unscheduled breakdown every day. And so I think we have a natural state of wanting to go where we want to go in, in every sense, right? Discharge our emotions, our feelings, cry with our friends, whatever it is. But like we have been conditioned and trained so early on to live according to the clock, according to the whatever is, is socially appropriate. And so like humaning is like be, being the soft tomato, right? which you have to, which you have to find um, w- within yourself. Right. And uh, I think even yesterday, someone tweeted me something like, uh, what advice do you have for, I think someone was tweeting about thinking and writing notes and like one of those kind of like, everybody has their own system and someone was asking me about my system and whether I have advice for how his system can do better. And like, I could tell you a bunch of things, but like all of the things that I do that work for me, it's built off of my own instincts and my own feelings. And like, if, if you end up internalizing what I tell you and I say, oh, always write ABC first or always do that first, then the instructions you're following in your brain is, oh, Visa said do this, so I'm doing this. And so that loses his sense. So the first instruction in his head is, so I'm, I'm training him to go now, right? Whereas he should be feeling his own body and his own mind and think, oh, I feel like doing this, okay, I'm going to do that. Like, right, that internalized instruction. So it's almost like you have to empty your cup from the the schedule external um kind of imposed schedules and imposed zoning laws or whatever. There's there's so many ways in which we have things to 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 legibilize and and kind of uh, partition things up for the convenience of others, for the convenience of society, factories, industries, whatever. And yeah, not, not, to, not to knock on the utility of having a schedule, the utility of having a system, but like, uh, I think humaning in this case is about, we do have that natural thing inside us, which is to, you know, when you see a child smile at you and you want to smile back, it's just, that's, that's a very deep internal thing. And we have that with everything, but like, we just have so many layers of programming, conditioning us to what is appropriate, what is correct, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you'll get it. So many things we do, we are sold uh, to be in our best interest. So many things we optimize because it's sold to us as, as, as something that will make our lives easier, whereas they are consciously designed to make other people's lives easier around us. So if you actually look at a list of your daily actions, how many things you do, how many characteristics you, you have put on yourself um, and consider yours, um, that are just designed to make other people's lives easier around you. And, and that's a little bit scary if you look at like how we train children to be as, you know, um, as low uh, conspicuousness and, and nuisance as possible. Um, when people, you know, when I encounter somebody who is really unsure of what to do, whether it's in their relationship or in, you know, in their job or where should they live, how should they live, they're unsure whether they have chosen the right lifestyle or are in a transition moment. I always just tell them like, if you want to know what you want, look at what you do. What do what you do when nobody forces you to do anything? If you have a Sunday and you're relatively free to decide how you spend it, you're home alone or you're in your garden, you're out, you know, in a park or doing sports, what do you actually do? Are you reading? Who are the people that you call? What topics you are, you know, seeking out on the internet? Because that you, if you just like observe yourself from the outside, 
you, you know, then you know what you want. That's what you want. And I'm not talking, of course, there are like pathological actions that you should stop, etc. But like in a, in a wholesome context, do you really call this person up when you have a free hour or not? Are you really that interested in learning Swedish right now that you claim to be on your LinkedIn? Is this really your favorite band or is it just something that sounded cool in school? I have, you know, and it's obviously, it's, this is why people get um, so vulnerable in, in long-term relationships, right? Whether, you know, family or friends or spouses, because you sometimes don't know what you want, but the other person who observes your actions knows. And there can be like this weird hierarchy that the other person in this particular instance knows more about you than yourself. And even that, even that is pretty crazy because um, that understanding is often based on long experience, right? Uh, but I've spoken to so many people who point out that that can become a kind of prison as well because like this person knows, like, you know, old friends, right? Like you, if you hang, I have a group of old friends who I meet like once every two years, like a bunch of guys from teenage days and we meet and we have beers and like, it's, it's nice. It's a, it's like a reminiscing on the past, but like we just, every time we meet each other, we, we, we regress in a way back to who we were. It's like, we are, we are nostalgic for who we used to be, I guess. And also our, like there's a conformity that it's, it, and it's, you know, it's a, uh, it's iffy, right? Like, on one hand, it's like this shared consensual, let's all regress together kind of thing. But on the other hand, it's like we each um, underestimate how complex the other guys are and how, you know, maybe one of them wants to go see a musical, right? Like we just, we've never had that conversation before. And so it's difficult to imagine how much, like, so there's this implicit pressure in every, I think in every marriage, especially, right? Like there's this implicit pressure to be the person that you've been all this while, right? Around the other person. Like if, it's weird for anybody to walk up to someone else that they've had a long routine with and say, hey, let's do something different today, right? Unless you, unless you have that dynamic in your relationship. But for lots of people, so it's tricky business. You have to, <laughs> it's always tricky. Absolutely. Any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um... Lots. I, I definitely relate to seeing, you know, seeing primary school friends or high school friends and feeling sometimes, I think especially if you're a person who's somewhat embraced change and just kind of realize like, okay, if, if nothing is permanent, let me go with this. Um, you can change quite a lot every few years. And then there is a, a sense of going back and almost feeling suffocated by that old persona in a way. And it's like, no, no, it's not this anymore. Um, but to go back to what you were saying earlier about becoming a soft tomato, which I really, really like. Um, yeah, yeah, so just super sweet and squishy. I think, yeah, I think I completely agree with that to, to answer Anna's earlier question. Um, I think humaning is a lot of unlearning and to use your metaphor, Anna, of, of being a city, it's going back to that role of the facilitator and of learning to be, to not be a dictator and have more of a democracy. And I think that's what you were referring to, Visa, when you say a lot of unlearning is, it's, it's just learning to listen to yourself. And like you said, Anna, in other ways, also observing yourself. And that's a very clear pattern that I can see in my life over the last few years. It's learning to notice who you are and what's actually there and what you do, like you said, if there's a free Sunday and not who you think you want to be, not that ideal and, and not the parts of you that you're slightly uncomfortable with and want to push away. Um, and I think similarly to like another aspect of all of this to go back to the tomato, humaning is also, I think, in many ways, really going back to nature, like the, the effect that going for a walk in the woods has on you or going for a swim or being by water or getting a little bit more sunlight. Um, and I think in some ways it's unlearning a little bit of our current living habits and not seeing that so much, so much um, as a norm and moving away from that slightly. 
Yeah, what do you guys another... think about? Sorry, just, can I just uh, add a footnote to uh, to university? What do you guys think about the um, a phrasing that would be like internal democracy? Love it. Yeah, I like it. It's fun. Yeah, I love it's, uh, it. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say an another one of my many riffs, which is related to the potty training thing, which is that um, kids are natural at being natural and then we socialize it out of them, which is that again, like, um, you know, like we as, as a species or, you know, as a, as, as a society, I guess, we seriously undervalue children as, and one of the ways I have a thread going about how like uh, I, have, I quote tweet people's, the things that kids say to people, and it's all these philosophical things like, um, you know, like the, the dad tells the child, like, I got to do work today because it's Monday. And the child says, Monday is a lie. <laughs> or someone else says, like, bedtime is a social construct. And, you know, it's true. That's the crazy thing. Like, kids will, which, which so one of my riffs now is that any philosophy department that doesn't have children in it is bullshit. <laughs> because children, you know, children are alien visitors from another planet and they are being introduced to our social norms for the first time. And they are asking, hey, why do I have to go to school? Why do I have to have a job? Why, why are there men with guns? Like, they have, we have to have these questions, ask these questions every day. We should get kids into the inter intellect, you know, it would be, because, it, and, and take them seriously as peers, not just, oh, today we're going to bring your kids to work kind of thing. Right. And because kids like we have to see that kids are naturally creative. Another thing I think uh, Venkat once mentioned is like with young children, young children never walk in a straight line anywhere. Like they're, they're skipping and spinning and, and dancing and playing. And like, you know, somewhere along the line, we learn to walk in straight lines. But like somewhere in our soul, the tomato does not want to walk in a straight line. But we've forgotten that. Right? We want to be dancing and singing all the time. And yeah, so another way we can get better at humaning is to watch the, the pros, right? And the pros are the kids. You see how they, you know, like they, they will, they'll show all their feelings on their face. And we learn to not do that. We learn to, you know, but the kid will be like, uh, you know, like which is natural. It's just the soft tomato, right? And because their feelings come all the way through, they're like, I want, I'm gonna, I want to, I, they start crying and stuff like that. And, and you know their feelings and they know their feelings, but then we, we, train it out of them right so we should one of my things is yeah we should really elevate children and not just be like oh we should just like so i think um david deutsch has this great thing about taking children seriously and and that's kind of a thing right like there's a sense of like children's children uh we we, we currently dismiss children and we should take them seriously and my frame is even a little bit more radical than that it's like we are dramatically underestimating and underutilizing what children have to teach us really about being fresh having fresh eyes having a sense of playfulness and and being human reminds me one of my uh, friends i uh, did a very serious modern dance training i think in paris i'm um, a couple of years ago he's a, he's a modern dancer and he was a, a ballet dancer classical and then was retraining um toward uh, modern dance and he explained to me that they had like this two day long workshop where all they did was like they relearned how to move. So you were supposed to kind of like lie down on your back um, as, a as a baby would. And first just like open your eyes, then move your eyes, then move your head, then move your head enough to like turn over. And then they basically like went through, you know how, how human evolution happens to all of us, right? We start in the womb kind of uh, 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 almost like a, 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 an early, early, early water creature. And then we go through all these stages and kind of like develop into humans. So every individual goes through the entire history of humanity, which is quite beautiful. Um, and then we also have this kind of um, um, process from childhood to adulthood in how we kind of gain our powers, right? And so it was quite shocking to me that, so this guy explains to me like, okay, so you lie on your back and you kind of like relearn how to move and then there was this phase when they were the toddler and then they learned to, 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 to stand and then they learned to walk. Um, and I felt like, first of all, it's a wonderful exercise and I'm sure it was very fulfilling to all the artists engaging in that, but it sounded also tragic. Like, I want to remember that stuff. It's kind of strange that you have to, as a really high ranking modern dancer, you know, best of your generation selected into these programs you relearn that freedom that children have with their movements 
or you know if you're a musician you will re relearn the joy when you're um, a painter you will relearn how to paint abstracts because they kind of like kick it out of you right or every child knows how to draw abstract that's all they know <laughs> and then we kind of like you take it away from them and then you grow them up into a best-selling painter and then you know you sell the canvases for like millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases and while I, I you know I have nothing against fine art I'm it, on the individual level there is something sad about it it's like we forget humaning and then we have to relearn it in really strange roundabout ways. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think there is, there is a frame that I like to play around with sometimes, which is in the way you do anything is the way you do everything, which I'm sure you, you have both heard before. Um, and I say it's dangerous because looking at the world that way can put you at a lot of risk, but also it, it's quite useful to... So for example, with dancing, um, if you both just like are in a room dancing around, you'll notice that you have, there are rules, there are subconscious rules that limit your movements, right? There is, you might not put your arm up, you might not, if you're a man, you might not move in ways that are considered particularly feminine. If you're a woman, there might be certain things that you're doing, um, and it's, like you said, we've we've taught ourselves all these ways of just not letting ourselves be. And so I completely agree with you. It's incredibly sad, especially in all, I found this in all creative endeavors. Um, South London noises right here for you, a bit of nature in the background. Um, yeah, in all creative practices, eventually you have to reach a point where you some way somehow have to become aware of these subconscious limitations and rules that are guiding your behaviors and get yourself out of them and then yeah you return to what your two-year-old brother is doing <laughs> and right. feel a little bit jealous because he's naturally got it yeah and and the great um irony is that we revere and we worship the soft tomatoes that stay soft like we as a as a civilization we force the tomatoes to get tough and then when one tomato manages to stay soft and then they you know then they're, they're creative they're playful they make great art they make great science by pursuing weird questions with persistence and then we're like oh wow look at this great creative genius but you know it's not it's not elusive right it's it's available to all of us but we just so many of us don't do it. It's like we will we will watch like a documentary about you know some very creative person doing amazing things, and we'll be like, what a great person! And then we'll go right back to you know like scolding people for being messy or for being just subtle social policing in whatever ways. So it's really it's again it's very tricky stuff, and you have to constantly or uh, repeatedly uh, become aware of the ways in which like we are dictatoring ourselves and each other, and then become soft yeah i love this and i actually have two questions kind of as a to create a coda for our wonderful conversation and thank you so much for being here from london singapore i'm stuck in brussels so uh, <laughs> it's quite a quite an international um endeavor one would be you know we can't really time travel and go back into our childhoods um to change it obviously we can improve the lives of people who are currently children um with more respect and attention and allowing of, of space for discovery. But what do you guys think and what are your personal strategies um, for relearning humaning in your own lives? And I know that you know, we all have our own ways of, of discovering things and I'm not looking to hear, you know, Nibiris's method to be applied to everybody obviously, but like, are there things that we can actually share and teach to others? Um, and I think my closing question will be, what are the, if I'm a very busy person, you know, if somebody works in an office, has three kids, a mortgage, a book deadline, um, you know, um, the Large Hadron Collider is not working uh, as it should, you know, whatever their problem is uh, on a daily basis. I'm, what would be the, the primary, maybe two, three areas of humaning that are a must? If somebody wants to do it, but they don't have a way to, um, you know, address all areas of life all at once. I'm maybe going to go back to your theory of like how you do one thing is how you do things. So maybe this person hopes that if they improve these two, three areas, 
they will learn something that can later on gradually be applied everywhere. Maybe the two questions are the same, actually. <laughs> Maybe I just asked the same, asked two questions that look, look to, like two questions, but they are in real easy one. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the two to three areas for me would be movement, making, and emotions or feeling. Um, and I think the, the feeling and movement ones are very, very closely tied, but they, might, they don't always appear that way in the beginning. Um, and so you were asking for, for strategies. Um, everyone's different and, and it, of course it depends on your disposition, but one thing that I found incredibly helpful is if we go back to the idea of our inner world being formed of multiple parts and there's the crazy in the brass and there's the very emotional in the brass. Um, I find it really helpful to, to have one part that is a child and that you relate to as a child. And it, I think, um, and I think especially like in these kinds of spheres and with the people we know, it's, it's very easy to become very, very intellectual and very theoretical and stay very much up in your head. And you can read psychology book after psychology book, trauma book after trauma book. Um, but I find relating to at least a part of myself as a child will just throw me right down into my body. And, and I have an entirely different and very emotional experience. Um, and maybe, maybe that's just the part of me that's quite nurturing and that wants to protect children. Um, but you, you start to have this really beautiful relationship and okay, sure, at first you're not gonna be able to skip down the street, that's okay. But you can start to see what that part wants and allow it a little bit of space. Um, so in the artist way, there is this, uh, there is a technique that the author recommends, or it's like a day, once a day during the week, you're meant to take yourself on an artist's date. And I think one thing you can do is, maybe not even one day a week, if that's too much, but once a month, you can take yourself on a play date. And you can think, okay, if there is this little, younger version of myself and if, if I could just give them two hours, three hours, four hours, what would they want and can I truly create that time and can I take them there? Um, and so I'd say that's one strategy. I could probably talk about this for hours so I'll pass the mic on to you Lisa. Yeah, I, I love this like so much. Whole... I just want to add one thing to Nibbers' point because I always laugh at this. Um, like somebody once asked me, like, why, why am I wearing all, all these dresses and jewelry? And, and you know, I, I lived in, in, in moments in my life where I was kind of dressing in the most womanish way uh, as compared with the other people. And I was always like, because that's how I remember that I'm a woman. Because in my head, I'm a, I'm a kid, right? I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Oh, let's read that. Oh, I'm building this. Like, leave me alone for like five months. I don't want to talk to you. And then, but if you dress in a, in a certain way, then in how people relate to you, you will be reminded. So I was, I, this is kind of my joke, jokey take on fashion. <laughs> That's great. It's so, it's, it, I, I was, you know, so when, when Anna asked the question, I was like, I was like thinking to myself and trying to find my answer. And then my answer was, children and then like i was like waiting and then you got the kids and i was like oh shit it's the same it's the same answer which is i mean i, I guess i uh, i approach it i might have a slightly different story for how i approach it which is that you know i think um every i think practically every human being has some memory of experiencing injustice as a child and it can be the most trivial and I'm not necessarily talking about like prejudice or sexism or racism or something dramatic, but like, you know, you wanted to do something and, and your parent told you to shut up and because their parents having a bad day. And that's so sad. Like it's, it's even though the parent is having a bad day and you love your parent and your parent loves you and everything, but like that moment where you're like, daddy, can we play? And then dad's like, shut up. I got work to do. Like it's sad. It's deeply sad. It's like, it's, you know, if, if there's two beings in the universe, a, a father and a child, and the fa like that's the whole universe, it's just father and a child, and the, father's, the child says, daddy, can we play? And the father says, no. Like, that's tragic. That's like, there's the whole of human misery in that abandonment and in that, that dismissal, not being seen, not being, what, what you just asked for, you're denied. You know, it's just at, it, the most fundamental, like, 
every culture, every language, every, you know, someone in Japan, someone in Africa, everyone gets that, like that sense of what it is to be a child who wants to do something and then it's taken from you or it's, it's denied or whatever. And I think everybody can, can go back to that in some way. Like you can watch a movie, a Pixar films even, right? Or whatever. I think all, all Pixar films have some, some element of that in some way. Um, like watching those films can, I think, help the mid- midwife you in a way, like guide you towards that kind of hit space. A lot of like, um, yeah, Moana, Wreck-It Ralph. But anyway, um, I always remember. And so another, another phrase that stuck with me for a very long time was when I watched a TED Talk by Eve Ensler. So Eve Ensler is the lady who did the, the Vagina Monologues play. And then she talked about how she had an alcoholic dad who was abusive and uh, like many, many years. And when she was a child, she would have this, this escapist fantasy that some kind of uh, like a Mr. Lion, like some, some fictional imaginary friend would come and rescue her from a situation. And it never came. You know, it was just she had to suffer through her childhood. And then, you know, she did the vagina monologues thing. And then that became a movement. And she was speaking with women all around the world. And then eventually, like one thing led to another. And she was involved in like, uh, I think somewhere in Africa, there was this like... Uh, vagina warriors kind of thing where they like this this community of women who rescue other women from um, like domestic violence and abuse and whatnot and they she was helping them um, like get funding and whatnot and like there was like there was like a like a I guess like a house or like a like a center where like where that's a refuge space for, for people and she was invited there and they were singing and dancing and in the talk that she gave on TED she said that when she experienced that, when she saw all the dancing and cheering and happiness, she felt like the the imaginary friend that she wanted to come and rescue her as a child. She felt like that happened, like that, that thing that she was waiting for, that she forgot about basically. But like in that experience of helping and healing others, she had helped and healed herself, right? And it's there's probably something about mirror neurons, and you know, like you with you. You, exp- you witness someone else, like, so you were a child and you were abandoned or abused or whatever, and then you witness someone else receiving the help that you didn't get, and you feel that in some, in some way, it, it fixes you in some way. It, I mean, broke, like, metaphors aside, but, like, it, it nourishes you in some way. And that has always stayed with me. I've always felt like uh, by helping and I always think of like kids, like kids who are struggling in school, kids whose parents don't take them seriously. I always try to keep the kids in mind. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, people ask me things like, Visa, how come like, uh, you know, you're becoming a little bit more famous on Twitter. You know, you could be selling, how, like I'm surprised that you're still kind of warm and, and like playful and not, you know, you could be like salesy and, and posting scheduled tweets. Like you still reply to people with like 50 tweets or 50 followers. Like why do you do that? And I'm like, because that person could be me. You know, that person could be the kid. Who need who who just I always wanted a visa in my life like you know like when I was a kid I did not have that older brother or that older person who took me seriously and cared about me so as much as I can I try to be that version of me for others and yeah there is there is um you know you can take it a bit too far and become like this self sacrificial martyr type and like you start bleeding everywhere over everybody and it's not sustainable so that's another lesson I have to learn but the the point is that um is the child thing is helping the children I guess and it, it sounds so cheesy it's like you know there's like talking tropes about oh it's all for the children like concern trolling but I you know I, I try to approach it in a very uh, straightforward and kind of um, like I don't want to get too bleeding hearty about it although I can whenever I want I, I can totally move myself to tears about it but like it's just you know it's it's you, you can readjust the narrative based on, like if you catch yourself becoming a bit too kind of self-righteous and like, oh, I'm doing stuff for the kids. What are you doing? Like, that's another trap, right? So you have to be careful with that. But like if, if you can keep your bearings and you can keep your, your sense of perspective and, and, and not turn it into a narcissistic thing or whatever, like just fundamentally um, help people and and see that so even when when people reply to me and it's a stupid reply and i get angry i'm like 
if I if I if I get into the right frame, I'm like oh you know it's it's the child in this guy saying can I play right and you're and you know I'm I'm reminded now like when I was a kid and I there there's like cousins who are younger and like you have a computer game and you want to play and then your mom will be like hey you should let your cousin play but your cousin doesn't know how to play he's not gonna he's just gonna smash the thing he doesn't know what he's doing he can't stop you're spoiling my game right but like you know now when I'm older and I see my my nephews and niece trying to play i'm like yeah you know we're, we're here together we're here to share and like even if you can't see it and you're gonna mess my stuff up like uh, now i have this hit space of it matters to me that you had a good time with me even if you don't actually understand me <laughs> like you 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 maybe figure it out down the line you'll realize that oh okay that guy was being unusually kind of um welcoming and inclusive when i probably didn't actually deserve it but and maybe they won't maybe maybe they'll just never get it but like that's the person i want to be and in being that person i heal myself i heal i i in being the presence that that uh you know lets the child play and i don't know if i deviated from the question uh, kind of the the, the, strat- the strategy thing i think uh is to just find some small element of that feeling so i don't really care about like specific tasks i don't i mean so there's infinite things right it can be music it can be dance it can be uh, photography do something like for me at one point it was cooking because when I was a child I was a picky eater and I had to teach myself how to have an intimate relationship with food and that was a whole emotional journey as well so everybody's thing is going to be different and the most important thing is kind of self resonance so whatever it is like so going for a self date that works like you you go there so that you can experience the self resonance and be like oh you know like uh, my inner child wants to dance wants to watch a silly movie or just something not practical or not interesting and then you just be there for them I rambled for very long but yeah you get it I like that I like that I think one thing that came to mind is so when you speak about the way that you responded to to the people and the replies and the reaction that you had to them in my mind humaning is it's having the toolkit and the skill set to work with that reaction that comes up and to be able to process that instead of throwing that anger back at, at the other people. And I think that's a skill set that you have and something that you've developed. Um, and I think that's just, for me, that's a very beautiful example of a lot of it wrapped up in one. I'm also hearing in your words um, this underlying message that humaning includes learn, letting go of the past in, in a way that you know helps you rediscover your freedom and your originality but also in a way where you're when you maybe stop looking for the outside master or the mentor and you become it and you don't you know you accept the fact that the people to whom you will be the mentor have more than you had maybe and enjoy the fact that it's from the lack of that that you felt the the feeling of missing it is what enables you to be that mentor in the first place. And I think we're all, it's definitely true about myself and the inter-intellect that I'm building something that I wish existed, that I also would like to be part of. And, and I think Nibras, when you write, Visa, when you write, you're creating works that you would like to read, right? We write books, we write, articles that we think should exist because we need them and and to me that's a really beautiful infinite game to create because someone will also be you know taking the baton and 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 continuing that strain of thought um as as a, a strange legacy that we have in the 21st century on the internet Thank you so much, guys, uh, for having been here with me, especially Visa. I know it's the middle of the night in Singapore. <laughs> um, and I'm so looking forward. I'm so looking forward to um, seeing you at the Interintact Salons and in the community. And Visa, tomorrow you have your first self-hosted salon that the yeah. entirety of the internet is talking about. It's heavily overbooked. <laughs> um, and everybody's really excited about it. And... I'm so happy that we're doing this. And, and I know that Nibras is soon going to be doing her own thing as well. So there will be a lot of uh, 
participatory humaning going on uh, in, in our little nook of the internet. Thank you so much, guys. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, and thank you for anybody who, who watched us today.